Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the Art UK conference. Um, my name is Holly Trusted. Um, I'm on the um, Art UK Sculpture uh, Steering Group, and I'm also Honorary Senior Research Fellow at the VA and co chair of the Public Statues and Sculpture Association. And it's a great pleasure to be chairing this session this morning, which is on new sculpture discoveries and research. Um, before we begin, I'm going to just give you a few housekeeping um, tips. Um, questions for the speakers should be left uh, via the Q&A button at the bottom. Um, the chat function is not enabled. Um, and questions will be asked to the speakers at the end of each session. So in this case, at the end of the three papers that we're going to hear. Closed captions are available thanks to live captioning by stage text and a transcript will be available after the conference on request. Uh, participants should uh, click on the closed captioning button at the bottom of their screen to access the captions. And finally, the session is being recorded and the video will be made available on Art UK's YouTube channel in due course. So on to the business of um, the morning, um, the first part of the morning. Um, as I say, we're, 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 we've got a, a great session ahead of us, and I actually wanted to add my thanks to Andy Ellis uh, from yesterday, um, Katie Goodwin Godwin for um, doing such a marvellous job in organising this conference, which we're all um, enjoying immensely. Um, the first speaker in our session is Marion Richards, who, um, who intriguingly um, says that um, her, her first degree in South Asian religion, belief and thought has renewed re relevance for her in the context of Art UK's sculpture project. Uh, Marion is the um, art detective manager for Art UK, and this is a wonderful facility, as you probably all know, where we can find out more about the images that we can see in the database. Um, and she's been doing great work on that. So I'll now hand you over to Marion and um, uh, leave the screen to her. Thank you very much, Marion. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just uh, sharing my screen. Can you see my shared screen? <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Here we are. Is that it? Great. Good, good. So, um, hello, I'm Marion Richards, the um, Art Detective Manager at Art UK, as Holly said. Um, I'm delighted to be starting today's session and uh, I'd like to give a short introduction to Art Detective uh, before describing some of our sculpture discoveries. Art Detective was launched in 2014 with the aim of improving knowledge about art in the public collection, national collection. Um, at the time, we just had oil paintings on the website and sculpture was added uh, to Art UK in February 2019 with the first sculpture inquiries reaching Art Detective the same month. We're a subject specialist network uh, which brings together expertise from a wide range of contributors such as dealers, uh, curators and members of the public uh, to support public art collections. We also have links to uh, other subject specialist networks which are listed here, the British Art Network, Understanding British Portraits, the Maritime Curators Group, European Paintings Pre-1900 and the Costume Society. You'll notice that we're not linked to a sculpture network, so uh, please make any suggestions you might have in the Q&A session. Our discussion forum is open to everyone and the discussions are linked to topic or regional groups. The group leaders are experts in their fields, often with an art history background or specific local or technical knowledge. Our sculpture group leader is Catherine Eustace, who's a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries and former editor of the Sculpture Journal. Today, I'll be speaking about sculpture discussions open to all on, on the public part of our website, but Art Detective also sends hundreds of updates uh, directly to public art collections every year. 
And these are things like uh, small but important details, such as amending a digit and a date uh, to new artist attributions supported by clear evidence. We typically handle 70 to 100 new inquiries every week, around 30 of which are sculptures. One of the best way to see some of these outcomes is to look at Diane Bilby's uh, Art Detective Sculpture Discoveries. Um, Diane, uh, the Sculpture Project funded Diane to help us for several months last year. And Diane was a visiting scholar at the V&A and was responsible for writing uh, over 700 uh, entries for its British, British sculpture catalogue. So what kind of discoveries have we made through our public discussions? I'd like to start with three bronzes. The identification of this eight by six bronze medallion at the Gordon Highlanders Museum is a nice little example of how we could help by amending an erroneous record. The collection's online record stated plaque depicting bust of French officer Petit Georges. Art UK inherited the title Petit Georges and the artist was recorded as JL, which is stamped bottom left. Dublin-based curator Kieran Owens suggested that Georges Petit, inscribed bottom right, was probably the artist's name instead. And it looked, and David Sewell noted that it looked like the work of a Belgian sculptor by that name and queried whether it could be a Belgian rather than a French army uniform. Kieran quickly found a link on the Art Medal website showing that the medal was issued in honour of Albert I, King of the Belgians, in his uniform and kepi, which identified the artist as Georges Petit. Petit fashioned a second medallion with the king as its subject in 1918. Petit's signature and date and the same JL monogram can be seen on the face. Kieran found that the JL monogram is, is for the foundry of Joseph Lissoir of Liège, and that the Royal Library of Belgium holds several examples of our medallion. Kieran was able to provide another good example of the artistic partnership between Petit and Lissoir in the form of collectible commemorative coins made in honour of the mothers of soldiers wounded in the First World War. This is a screenshot of the updated Art UK page. We were able to conclude that the sculptor was Georges Petit, the initials JL refer to the foundry of Joseph Lissoir of Liège, and the sitter was confirmed as Albert I of Belgium. Both the sculptor and the foundry are new additions to the list of artists on Art UK. A very different type of uh, bronze next, a figure known only as African Group, owned by Aberdeen Art Galleries and Museums, Artist Unknown. Despite being listed as Artist Unknown, this, place, this piece was signed on the back. From the version on the site, the inscription looked something like A-P-U-J-N, Brussels. Andrew Shaw suggested it could be a Belgian sculptor, probably 20th century, and asked for ideas. It was Andrea Coleman who found us the answer. She discovered a very similar signature on a piece displayed on the Live Auctioneers website. Described as Arthur Puit, Belgium, early 20th century, a large seated bronze sculpture of a blacksmith signed a Puit resting on a naturalistic bronze base. On a Belgian antiques website, Andrea found another example of Puit's work, this crouching um, antique bronze panther. She was able to add that the sculptor's dates were given as 1873 to 1955 on several auction websites. Barbara Bryant, another group leader who was following this discussion, found an article which looked relevant given the African context. In volume 32 of L'Art Moderne, 1912, there was a mention of a piece by Puig called A Copper Foundry Katanga. Regular contributor E. Jones also told us that he sometimes used an AP monogram too. She found that he trained at the Académie des Beaux-Arts, established himself in the municipality of Forest in the Brussels capital region of Belgium, and he worked on small sculptures, memorials and graves, as well as World War I memorials. He also produced medallions in collaboration with other artists. A number of examples can be seen in the collection of the former Royal Library of Belgium. 
we were able to attribute the piece, give it a title, and find out that the sculpture is a cast of a small figure group called Fonderie de Cuivre au Katanga, a copper foundry Katanga, cast in 1912 and purchased in that year by the Royal Museum for Central Africa. It's not certain whether this Aberdeen sculpture was a unique cast or one of an addition. It was obtained by Sir Robert Williams, who was largely responsible for discovering the copper deposits in Katanga. He bequeathed it in the, to the collection where it was formally accessioned in 1946. It's the only item by Arthur Puit in a UK public collection. This is a wonderfully rich account to offer the collection from having known next to nothing. I'd like to focus on some work uh, we've done for the Royal Academy of Music next, one bronze and one marble. Before this bust came to Art Detective, it was listed as bust of an unidentified female by an unknown artist. And before that, the artist was identified as an Ada Lewis. Ada Lewis appears to have been a recording error, as Osmond Bullock noted that there was an Ada Lewis who was a generous benefactor at the Royal Academy of Music, but she died in 1906. It was suggested that the sitter probably had a strong connection to the Royal Academy of Music, perhaps as a pioneering composer, musician or teacher. Albert Toft was suggested as the sculptor, with Martin Hopkinson asking whether there was really any certainty that the artist was British. A composite of images showing Toft's monogram was attached to the discussion, and I think you can see why uh, people would have thought it was um, that artist. Clara Schumann and Gertrude Stein were considered and discounted as possible sitters. Um, I think it's quite clear why they were suggested. There's a definite similarity in all these faces. However, it was James Trollope who provided the breakthrough we needed, suggesting the mezzo-soprano Elena Gerhardt. Osmond Bullock added that Gerhardt must have had a relationship with the Royal Academy, um, as they have a leader prize named after her. He attached composite images from the Library of Congress collection. In the second, uh, circa 1920 to 25, she had started sweeping her hair back hard into a bun. Osmond remarked that this made Martin's query about the nationality of the sculpture, sculpture very relevant, because in 1928, Gerhardt was based in Germany. She was then aged 45. There are further examples here from Osmond. Uh, Kieran Owens added helpful biographical information on Gerhardt, including that although she was based in Germany in 1928, she appeared in London several times that year for a series of four Schubert centenary concerts. She moved to London after the Nazis came to power in Germany in 1934 and took up a teaching position at the Guildhall School of Music, becoming a British citizen after the end of the war. She died at her home in Hampstead, aged 77, in January 1961. Andrew Shore, Art UK's head of content, whose degree in music has come in very, very useful over the years, has been wonderfully helpful, and he proposed Albrecht Leistner as the artist. His works include bronze heads and busts of several German composers and musicians, and you can see the monogram on the composite image provided by Kieran in a bust in a bust of actor Lothar Kerner, 1918. Then, in a wonderful find, Andrea Coleman discovered a plaster cast of our bust in the Stadtgeschichtliches Museum in Leipzig. Acknowledging all the main contributors, group leader Catherine Eustace summed up, from an almost hopeless position, this rapidly became an open and shut case. Sitter or subject Elena Gerhardt, mezzo-soprano, sculptor Albrecht Leisner, signed with a monogram and dated 1928. This was a very satisfactory conclusion. And most importantly, two figures from the diaspora suffered in the mid 20th century, a diaspora which gave so much to this country, regain their place in history. Thanks to the Sleuths and Art Detective, they should not easily lose their identities again.
I'd like now to mention uh, here in brief, an exceptionally long discussion, 125 comments um, started by Jacinta Regalado about a marble bust in the same collection of Carlo Alfredo Piatti, cellist, composer and teacher, signed G. Manzoni. And the question was, is this by Giacomo Manzoni, active 1909 or earlier? Could we find his birth and death dates and examples of his work and signature? The sculptor was confirmed as Giacomo Manzoni of Bergamo, his dates found, and the bust has been dated 80, circa 1898 to 1909. This is the only work by Manzoni of Bergamo in a UK public collection, as far as we know, but we were sent photographs of another version um, at the Teatro at Donizetti in Bergamo. The Royal Academy of Music's curator responded, it's wonderful to have such a depth of information about this object in our collection. I will suggest that a concert be arranged once we are all free of this dreadful pandemic. In a happy coincidence, Piatti's year of birth, 1822, coincides with the bicentenary of the Royal Academy of Music, and this would be a fitting tribute for both this fine musician and the institution, as well as honouring the time and effort that has gone into this research. I'd like to thank um, Peter van der Merwe for collecting all, for gathering all the information about Manzoni into a biography for Art UK and Italian art historian Victor Veronese for his re research in the archives in Italy and for sending us this photograph of the version in the Donizetti Theatre. My final object um, is another marble bust, uh, a question again posed by Jacinto Regalado. This discussion attracted 133 comments, even more. The collection sent a photograph of the inscription, which showed that the date had been misread. It was not 1897, but 1891. Kieran Owen's realization that the first initial was G led rapidly to him identifying the sculptor as Gertrude Emily Devonish Walsh of South Ascot, Berkshire, who died as a widow at Marseille in 1907. In the course of the discussion, we learned much about Gertrude's background, including that she was married to David William Mitchell, a well-known zoologist and illustrative artist. Four months later, he committed suicide by shooting himself at Neuilly-sur-Seine near Paris. Five years after this tragedy, Gertrude remarried Edward Frederick Devonish Walsh, a successful property developer who became one of the directors of the Westminster Land Company formed to build Westminster Cathedral. Although they had a home in South Ascot, the Walshes appear to have spent much of their time in later years in the Riviera with a property in Nice. Social reports in French newspapers of the period suggest they were by then part of a wealthy and aristocratic circle who entertained lavishly. Kieran discovered that the 23rd February 1891 um, European edition of the New York Herald printed in Paris singled out Madame Gertrude E. Devonish Walsh's Lilas Blanc for special mention among sculpture shown at the Ladies Salon. There's a crowned monogram on the socle, the principal letter being N under a baronial coronet, and the work had the received title of the Countess, suggesting the sitter might be of aristocratic European connection. The evident misalignment of bust and socle were pointed out by both Catherine Eustace and Osmond Bullock. You can read more about this in a new discussion that we have about this sculpture, which was just started this week. But in brief, during cleaning, the bust had been replaced in the wrong position. And so it may in fact be original to, to the piece itself. The outcome was very satisfying. We closed the discussion with C.E. Devonish Walsh, identified as Gertrude Emily Devon Devonish Walsh, 1831 to 1907. Uh, the title was updated from female bust to the original French title Lilas Blanc. A misread date was amended from 1897 to 1891. Peter van der Merwe produced a biographical summary from the discussion, the only such account of this artist known to date. When to close a discussion is a really difficult decision. There's always potentially more to be said and found. 
I think we all felt, given the constraints on research caused by the pandemic, that we had got as far as we could. Before I did close it, I mentioned our fruitless search for an online version of the catalogue to Linda Whiteley, research associate in the Department of the History of Art at the University of Oxford, where she has taught since 1995, in case she knew of a copy. I thought she might. She promised to keep an eye out for it, and the discussion was closed. Soon afterwards, Sorry. Soon afterwards, Linda's friend and colleague, Laure de Marjorie, director of the French Sculpture Census, kindly sent a photograph of a reproduction of the relevant page from the 1891 catalogue um, from Pierre Sanchez's 2010 Dictionary of the Union of Women Painters and Sculptors. Here it is, Lilas Blanc, with a subtitle, Madame la Baronne L. de N. A conference like this is a huge pool of knowledge and interest, so please do read our new discussion and help to identify her if you can. As Manta Sorelli, our group leader for Northwest England says, Art Detective comes with a warning, it's pretty addictive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marion. That was a great start to um, today's um, conference, uh, the, the second day of the conference, um, and your paper also very nicely leads into Malcolm's paper because you ended up mentioning a sockel. Um, there are many questions I'm sure um, that we want to ask you, um, and as you say, it's it's an addictive process, this getting engaged with sculpture, so thank you again. We'll come back when we, we have the questions after all two papers. Um, so now it's a a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Malcolm Baker, Distinguished Professor Emeritus of the History of Art at the University of California, Riverside, and very importantly for us, a member of the Art UK's Sculpture Steering Committee. Um, Malcolm is known to many of us, um, uh, and uh, especially for his um, knowledge and expertise in 18th century British sculpture, but he ranges much more widely than that and he is a, a marvellous teacher. He's um, had a lot of teaching experience. So um, his talk uh, this morning is on busts, sockles and settings, Rubiliac's busts for Lord Ligonier and their context. So over to you, Malcolm. Thanks very much, Holly. Um, just to get my oops, screen here. Um, There we are. Okay, thank you. Um, prominent among the works of sculpture that are now happily to be seen on Art UK's website are very many portrait busts, and um, uh, Marion has already shown us some of these. So um, the portrait bust as a sculptural portrait that unlike a statue shows only the head and shoulders of um, the sitter represented, busts like um, that of Virginia Woolf here. But very often bust consists not just of the head and shoulders, but also of the bases and sockles that represent them. Now one very welcome aspect of the images reproduced by Art UK is the inclusion of those features so often missing from museum catalogues and websites the sockles and the backs. So here's one such example uh, from Noel um, from the Art UK website uh, of the Duchess of Dorset by uh, Thomas Kirk. And uh, uh, here's uh, Jean-Baptiste Boudard's bust of Francois uh, Viette um, in the Bose Museum showing the back, so difficult to find um, if, if, if you're uh, looking for these images usually. Now, what do I mean by a sockle? These terms and their use can be uh, rather fluid. Now, the common generic term is base, but following uh, Nicholas Penny's analysis, I'm drawing a distinction between different types of base, uh, different types of pedestal, plinth, and sockle. So on the far left, 
um, you'll see an image not on the Art UK website, um, Verrocchio's Gattamalata, uh, which stands on a tall pedestal. And uh, then uh, to the right, the bottom, you have a plinth, that's um, Nollekin's monument to Elizabeth Howard with a horizontal plinth. And uh, then on the far right, the one we've just seen, um, uh, Kirk's um, Duchess of Dorset on its sockle. And then above, Grimwood's Viscount uh, Cowdery in Colchester Museum, uh, which has a, um, a bust on a sockle uh, placed on a pedestal. So um, pedestals, plinths and sockles are significant because of the ways in which they moderate our viewing of a sculpture. Such bases form a significant component of freestanding sculptures and play an important role in what we might term the staging of sculpture to use Alex Potts's phrase. This has been increasingly recognized by those who write about the history of sculpture, um, just as historians of painting, painting started looking uh, some time ago more closely at the frames around pictures. Though often overlooked now, bases of various sorts have engaged the attention of major artists. Most famously, there is Michelangelo's plinth for the antique uh, equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius on the Capitoline Hill. And this was a much imitated type. So you see it imitated on, um, on the bottom right, on um, Nollekin's um, Howard Monument that we've already seen, but then on, on a small scale on, um, as, as, as the, the base of a uh, small bronze by Jean Bologna. Pedestals and plinths um, below statues were significant, not least because they provided a field for the des a descriptive and complementary text, as we see on the Nollekins monument here, but also on a more contentious example, the statue of the um, plantation owner Christopher Codrington at All Souls, Oxford. Um, the inscription, uh, uh, which is a quotation from Addison's, one of Addison's Latin poems, um, uh, details his achievements as a soldier and as a scholar, as well as his, the bequest of his library. Today, of course, we are especially conscious of what such te texts omit, especially uh, in the case of figures involved in the slave trade, not least Codrington. Um, I was thinking of this yet last night when I was listening to, to, to Mary Beard and, and, and Jeremy Della. Now, what about busts and their sockles? We can follow the development of certain distinctive types from the 17th century onwards. So um, on the left, you will see uh, an engraving of a lost bust of Charles I, either by um, uh, Bernini or possibly Dussa. Um, with a distinctive um, form of sockle with a bowed front. And then on the right, um, Lemoine's bust of the painter Coipel, um, where the sockle is not, is not only physical, physically integral with the bust itself, but also conceived as part of one composition. A perceptual game is being played here with the viewer. What is the figure and what is the sockle or support? The sculptor is negotiating with the convention of the truncation, that's the cutting off of the um, upper part of the figure, or cutting off of the lower part of the figure, and the viewer's expectations about this convention. More often, however, bust and sockle were separately carved. Sculptors in their workshops often used distinctive types, so that in 18th century Britain, there are some clear patterns we can recognize. On the left, a bust by Reisbrack with a high waisted circular sockle. Uh, and on the right, a, a bust by Joseph Wilton with a characteristic low oval sockle with coat of arms. Uh, sometimes matching sockles were used to connect busts belonging together as a group in a specific setting. Um, 
Here are two busts by different sculptors uh, with similar um, arrangements of coats of arms on the socket, Lord Cobham and the Earl of West Westmoreland. And these were designed to stand on regularly placed matching pedestals within the Temple of Friendship at Stowe. Various distinctive types of sockle were also used um, by Louis-Francois Roubiliac, Reisbrecht's main uh, rival in mid 18th century England. Most common was the square sockle, um, the square waisted sockle, as in these examples of John Ray at Trinity College, Cambridge and uh, Alexander Pope, the Barber Institute. And sometimes um, these had added medallions. And here you have the, the, the bust of Andrew Fountain at Wilton, um, with, with, um, which imitates, reproduces the reverse of a slightly earlier uh, medal um, by Dacier. Sometimes all this becomes more nuanced. So, um, uh, oh, and here's the, um, the, oh, sorry, the, there's a second type. Um, used by Rubiliac later um, with um, Charles I uh, with a bowed front and Princess Amelia. Now, sometimes this becomes more nuanced. Um, so you, on the left, you have Chesterfield um, on this familiar square um, wasted plinth, but with an elaborate shaped cartouche with his coat of arms. And then this is used periodically um, it, on the uh, bust, Rubiliac's bust of Hogarth, where instead of a coat of arms, you have a, a, a painter's palette used as a sort of false coat of arms. So here we see um, an individual sculptor using a range of different types of sockle. Um, sculptors um, used sockles that were mainly specific to their own workshops, but sometimes, as in these examples by Rubiliac, modeled according, modified according to the, the individual sitter. All this forms a background to an unusually specific and complicated case involving quest, questions about a bus setting. Um, concerned here with the bus of George II and Lord Ligonier uh, in um, the Royal Collection. These are among Rubiliac's finest and most ambitious portrait busts, which is still rather Baroque swagger, is combined with subtly nuanced textures and highly finished carved surfaces. Although much, not much taller than most of Rubiliac's busts, they have an unusual grandeur, not least through their dra dra drapery effects on their sweep and breadth. Probably executed about 1760, and probably perhaps connected with Ligonier's, uh, Ligonier's debates about how you pronounce this, uh, elevation to the peerage. Um, these were almost certainly commissioned by Ligonier himself. Payment of £153, an unusually large sum for two busts, was recorded in the General's regimental accounts on the 12th of February, 1763. Actually, after Rubiliac's death, um, Ligonier was obviously a late payer. Um, then in 1817, the two busts were presented to George IV by Ligonier's descendant, a Mrs. Lloyd. By the late uh, 1820s, both busts were displayed at Windsor, uh, where all the busts were placed on new circular sockets so as to form a harmonised display. But these 19th century circular sockets were quite different from any type used by Rubiliac. A plaster version of the Ligonier bust, drawn by Nollekin, um, at Rubiliac's posthumous sale in 1762. So drawing on the left, and this comes from the Art UK's website, um, uh, the plaster version was, was apparently set on the familiar square sockle with a medallion at the front, uh, like the type used earlier for the bust of Andrew Fante. So here Rubiliac was employing a standard element in his workshop repertoire of designs. But this familiar type was not the form uh, that was in fact used for the marbles of Ligonier and the King, 
The original circles had in fact been much grander, as can be glimpsed in a view of the staircase landing at Carlton House, where the two busts were displayed prior to their move to, uh, to Windsor, and you can see them on the far left and the far right. The circles visible here were unusually large and sat awkwardly on the supporting pedestals. Although the circle for Ligonier's own bust does not survive, that for George II has happily been brought to light in the course of Jonathan Marsden's work on his catalogue of sculpture in the Royal Collection. So here on the right is the bust of George II on its original circle. And you can see the contrast with the bust on its 19th century circle uh, demonstrates clearly how the original circle played a role in how the bust was viewed. The circle is, a, is of an exceptional scale with a breadth matching and echoing that of the bust itself, but its form is puzzling and atypical. The size certainly explains the large payment for the two busts, but what are we to make of the design? One prominent feature, the massive spreading volutes that flank the central support, recall the similarly exaggerated volutes on Rubiliac's uh, Shannon monument. But other details uh, diverge from uh, Rubiliac's familiar formats. The arms, for example, are contained within a stiffly rectilinear frame, quite at odds with the asymmetrical cartouches the sculptor usually employed. Why? The answer, I think, lies in the setting. Exceptionally, we can identify with some confidence the interior in which these two busts were placed. While Ligonier's country house has been much altered, his townhouse at 12 North Audley Street in Mayfair uh, survives with its interiors intact. At the rear was an impressive gallery described by, described by Christopher Hussey as perhaps the most beautiful early Georgian room surviving in London. This was probably designed between 1728 and 1730 by Sir Edward Lovett Pierce, architect best known for the Irish House of Parliament in Dublin. The niches at each end are just the right size to accommodate the two busts and their unique circles. Rather than the niches being designed with the bust in mind, it was the other way around. So um, here you have the bust and the, the gallery. So the busts execute, were executed about 1760 to fit within the niches of an interior designed some 30 years earlier. This may have prompted the effect of grandeur that makes these two busts exceptional. Did Ligonier ask for busts with the panache and presence appropriate to this grand room? More than that, however, Rubiliac was evidently taking account not only of the scale of the niches, but also of the other decorative features of the interior. Here, I suggest, lies the excellent explanation for that unusually shaped cartouche. Its rectilinear form may be atypical for Rubiliac, but it corresponds exactly with the shape employed in the center of the room's chimney piece. And perhaps the, the volutes also sort of invert what we see on the chimney piece. Be that as it may, what we can say is that as far as the sockles are concerned, this is a highly unusual case of a sculptor taking account of the intended setting and responding to and imitating an earlier format. Only rarely can we connect busts with specific settings. Even more rarely do we find sockles being given such a role or such prominence. Exceptional though this case may be, it alerts us to the significance of sockles and the ways in which they might shape our viewing of a bust. Sockles matter and perhaps we should pay more attention to them, as the Art UK Sculpture Programme has indeed done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malcolm. That was um, fascinating um, and uh, very much related to Art UK, but also um, looking 
further afield. Um, and again, we have questions which we're saving up for the end of the, the whole session. Um, uh, and so we'll return to that. So thank you again, great, great paper. So our final speaker is Rebecca Wade. Rebecca is an art historian and curator um, with interests that lie between 19th century museum and exhibitionary cultures, uh, as well as art and design education and the production, circulation and display of sculpture and its reproduction. And her latest book on Bruciani and the former Tory um, in London, uh, which I would warmly recommend, um, 90, sorry, former Tory in 19th century Britain, not just London, um, was published in 2019. Um, uh, in the panel responsibilities for Leeds Sculpture Collection, collaborating with Art UK to share data and to bring sculpture into local schools. And indeed, her talk this morning is about a wonderful sculpture at Leeds, which I must say has always intrigued me personally. Um, it's the uh, 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 the Veiled Venus by Kuna Beveridge and Ella von Breda. Um, apologies if I have mispronounced those names, uh, but uh, I'm sure we're going to find out much more about the people and the sculpture from Rebecca. So over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Holly, and thank you very much to Art UK and to Casey Goodwin for organising this brilliant conference. It's really a privilege to speak this morning. So this short paper considers one object and three subjects, two makers and one model. It's been motivated by my work with the Leeds Sculpture Collection and more specifically a body of research on the development of the collection from its inception in 1888 to the turn of the century. The sculpture in question, The Veiled Venus by Cuna Beveridge and Ella von Freda, occupies the very end of this chronology, having been completed in 1900 and presented to the collection in 1901. This striking sculpture has been on almost continuous display at Leeds Art Gallery for as long as I can remember. For a provocative object that has had such a long public life by a family who were hardly ever out of the newspapers in their own lifetime, it's generated surprisingly little scholarship. For this reason, I would like to take the opportunity this morning to begin to sketch a context for both the object and the people who brought it into being. The family in question are a mother, daughter and a sister. Mother and daughter were recorded as the sculptors and the sister as the sitter. It was Ella von Vreda, born Ella Reutzke in North America to a German mother. A dramatist, musician and dressmaker at various times, the extent of her work on the Veil of Venus is difficult to determine as it was her daughter, Kuna Beveridge, who trained and practiced as a sculptor. During Beveridge's early career in the decade before the production of the Veil of Venus, the periodical press accused her mother, Von Vreda, of stage managing her daughter's career. In 1892, The Wave reported that, I quote, Beveridge is quite incapable of taking the steps that secured the degree of notoriety she has already achieved. The push and energy is all supplied by her mother. This narrative persisted and 10 years later, a reporter for Town Talk wrote of Von Vreda. She understands the art of advertisement so thoroughly that even Sarah Bernhardt's press agent might learn from her. Kuna Beveridge was born at the executive mansion in Springfield, Illinois, where her paternal grandfather was state governor at the time. It's most likely that she lived in October 1874, although the tendency to move forward over the years. Beveridge had an itinerant childhood and studied in Dresden, San Francisco, New York, and Paris. During her time in San Francisco between 1889 and 1892, she attended Cogswell Polytechnical College in the Mission District, where she studied with the Bavarian sculptor Rupert Schmidt. It's possible that there's some relationship between Schmidt's California Venus, completed around 1895, having originally been intended for the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, and the Veiled Venus, although it may be that all they share is a superficial stylistic similarity and title. Beveridge first attracted public attention in 1891 
the age of around 17, when she was noted as a society beauty with aspirations of a stage career. The weekly periodical The Wave published a brief account of her life in San Francisco. It was in this year that Beveridge began to exhibit sculpture in public, showing a bust of the Prussian American engineer and politician, Adolf Sutro, and an ideal head at the 1891 San Francisco Mechanics Institute Industrial Exposition. Her background as the granddaughter of a state governor and emergence as a society figure in her own right seemed to have granted her early access to public figures, favorable portraits of whom have of course long formed a means of advancing a career in sculpture. Despite being awarded a diploma for these exhibits, Beveridge's nascent public profile almost immediately resulted in a backlash. The Wave magazine's coverage became increasingly hostile. They reported, I quote, Adolf Sutro was one victim of her talent for sculpture and the result of her efforts was so excellent that Rupert Schmidt, her teacher, forgot to be silent in regard to his share of the achievement. While Schmidt's role in the production of the bust is difficult to substantiate, even if it were true, it seems churlish to admonish a teenager for still being under the tutelage of another artist. The following year, Beveridge moved to a studio in New York where she was at work on a life-size model of a male athlete titled Sprinter, intended to be cast in bronze for the aforementioned Chicago World's Fair in 1893. The magazine of art recorded a fortunate and I owing to the young artist's lack of experience in, in the statue never reached the jury for admission, for it was too much injured in being cast by a cheap but clumsy workman. It's doubtful if it would ever have passed, since on the one hand it belonged with the California exhibits, and on the other it had technical defects which the jury would have found insuperable. But the statue was a very extraordinary achievement for a young girl who shows an almost too precocious facility for her age and the instruction she's received, end of quote. In the same year, 1893, Beveridge was also profiled by the author Gertrude Atherton, who had herself sat for a portrait bust by the sculptor. She described her as the most talked of woman sculptor of the day and praised this latest work, Sprinter, as having been, in her words, modelled with anatomical exactness, so instinct with life that the very clay seems no longer a fit synonym for death, yet striking the most unlessened beholder with its dignity, its power, and the gravity which, following some eccentric deflection, has found its way into the dreamy brain and delicate fingers of a girl. The accompanying illustration you can see here does not appear to fulfill the promise of these words, although the author noted the difficult circumstances of its execution. In a cold room with no north light, no turning table, no one even to help her mix the clay. When it was finished, she went to bed dangerously ill and the figure was half ruined in the casting." End of quote. Later that year, aged 19, she married for the first of three times. Her new husband was the actor Charles Coughlin, then aged 52. The marriage was over within a year after Coughlin returned to the woman men he had already assumed to be her, his wife. The effect of this scandal, which had been the subject of much feverish speculation over what some presented to have been a case of bigamy, was to discourage, discourage Beveridge's theatrical ambitions in favour of a recommitment to sculpture. In the immediate aftermath, she made two as yet untraced uh, sculptures titled The Devil's Victim and The Devil's Wife, which seemed to demand a biographical interpretation. Beveridge remained a regular fixture in the North American press with reports that were by turns a few over her youth, beauty, breeding, artistic ability and European training, or on the other hand, critical of her grasping for attention through salacious sculptures, disastrous marriages and expensive dresses. One article criticized her pursuit of publicity and patronage in the following terms. She aims at the striking in the decadent or any other realm where she can obtain notice. She seems to know the tree where the wealthy art lovers grow and she never has any trouble in shaking one down whenever she wants to sell a statue. More cutting still was the assertion that, I'm quoting here, Kuna would have made a good sculptor if she'd not been so enamored of the stage. Her idea was to become an actress. She never studied conscientiously the details of either art. Kuna succeeded in doing one thing, keeping in the public eye. 
So like Sarah Bernhardt before her, who Beveridge also mo modeled a bust after when she was just 17, her association with the stage, presence in the press and status as a woman, we used to construct a public persona that cast her sculptural practice somewhere between a dilettante affectation and an unnatural endowment of an otherwise masculine genius. According to an emergency passport application in 19, the decade between 1896 and 1906 in England and France, one source recorded that it was Sarah Bernhardt who offered to take her to Paris in preparation for a stage career. Beveridge was in Paris in 1896 at the time of the Royal Academy of Arts Summer Exhibition in London, at which she presented two terracotta busts. Most biographical accounts of Beveridge mention that she studied under Rodin during this time. A collection of letters from Beveridge to Rodin are held in the Musée Rodin, which show that their correspondence began in 1897 and lasted around a decade. Aside from advice about securing institutional support and opportunities to exhibit, it's very difficult to substantiate the extent of any formal she, training she received from Rodin. Neither is it clear where and when Beveridge and von Vrede began working on the Belle Venus. In 1898, Beveridge briefly returned from Paris to the United States on the occasion of her short-lived second marriage. She spent the second half of 1899 in London, where she exhibited recent work at the Carlton Hotel, dominated by sculptures of and for figures embedded in the colonization of South Africa, including Cecil Rhodes, Alfred Bight, and Leander Scar Jameson. It was reported she'd made a great deal of money from these millionaire magnates and built a strong reputation in the country before the Boer War. This connection was consolidated through her third marriage in 1903 to a mine owner from Johannesburg, with whom she was expected to retire to South Africa. But returning to Paris, the Veiled Venus had been selected for display as part of the United States section of the Universal Exhibition of 1900. The work did not receive one of the main prizes, but was awarded an honorable mention. That the sculpture attracted notice at all was significant, particularly as a relatively small horizontal bronze in a forest of vertiginous marble. The aim of the United States section had been to demonstrate a firm distinction between their mode of artistic production and the French, although they were not thought to have succeeded in moving away from European precedents. Indeed, a French source took great pride in noting that the veiled Venus was by an American sculptor and presented in the United States, except the LeBron, cast by LeBron Barbadien, um, the leading Parisian foundry responsible for the production of many of Rodin's works in bronze. It's possible that her use of this foundry was a tangible result to the correspondence between Beveridge and Rodin. The sculpture attracted some notice in London, in, including the following short piece in Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News in 1891, and you probably won't be able to read the, the short text underneath the portrait, so I'll read it out here. It says, uh, the artistic abilities of Miss Beveridge, one of the best known of American lady sculptors, are widely recognized, not only in her own country, but in Paris and London. Although she is quite young, she has done many works which have been exhibited at the Royal Academy, the Paris Salon, and at Berlin, Munich, Munich Dresden, and other continental art centers. Perhaps her most popular success was the exhibit in the Paris Exposition of last year, entitled The Veiled Venus. This very beautiful life-size nude figure was done by Miss Beveridge in collaboration with her mother, Baroness Ella von Vreda, and brought great credit to both of these talented ladies. The work was purchased by a Yorkshire gentleman and will be presented by him to the Leeds Museum. The term collaboration is noteworthy here. It emerges more than once in contemporary commentaries, although the nature of the collaboration between mother and daughter was never articulated. While Ella von Vreda appears to have taken a very active role in the career of both her daughters, the Veiled Venus seems to have been the only work of sculpture to which her name was attached. An ungenerous assessment close to the way in which the contemporary periodical press interpreted the relationship might suggest it was a strategy to extend the public profile of the whole family by association with Kuna Beveridge's growing reputation as a sculptor. A Yorkshire gentleman did indeed present the Bale Venus to Leeds Art Gallery anonymously in 1901. Although the published records preserve the anonymity of the donor, 
the original accessions register shows it to be have been given by Henry Herbert Riley Smith, then the head of John Smith's brewery in nearby Tadcaster. This was the only work listed in the first two catalogues of the permanent collection that did not reveal the identity of the benefactor. Described in an obituary notice in 1911 as one of the best known public and commercial men in Yorkshire, it's tempting to speculate that Riley Smith may have been motivated to maintain his anonymity, not through modesty, but rather concern over the potential for lurid interpretations of the sculpture. By contrast, the second and third generation industrialists that formed his peer group appear to have been only too keen to have their donations made part of the public record. The model for the Veiled Venus was Kuna Beveridge's younger sister, the actor Ray Beveridge, known as the American Venus. The two sisters returned to this theme in 1908 when it was reported that Kuna was planning a sculpture of a draped Venus, again based on Ray. It seems likely that this work was announced to coincide with the opening of their play, The American Venus Up to Date, later in the same year, in which Ray played the role of a wife and model. Variety published the following review. Quite a crowd gathered for just between us, everyone thought they would be pulled off a disrobing scene and just between us, that's what brought the crowd. But nothing came off, not even the drapery from Miss Beveridge. Ray wouldn't uncover and the word had gone forth. It's tough on respectable married men expecting much and only catching a glimpse of bareness. It's no use wasting time with the American Venus up to date. It's not up to date. If you want a real Venus now, you must be naked. And if you are naked enough, just between us, it doesn't matter whether you are a Venus or no. End of quote. So this shocking assessment of the production based on the absence of nudity, the revealing comments on what exactly constitutes a new body in public space. At one time, Ray Beveridge stipulated in her contracts that she would not appear on stage with more than half of her body uncovered, yet the veiled Venus presents her form almost entirely so albeit with a greater degree of mediation. It both is and is not her body. Several quiet years followed the Veil Venus and Beveridge's third and final marriage, but she returned to public attention in 1910 with an exhibition of new work in Leipzig, which she'd made in Berlin over the course of the previous six months. Alongside a series of allegorical busts and figures, Beveridge presented a work that the New York Times described as the most daring work her chisel has ever attempted and the absolute limit in artistic boldness. Her life-size sculpture, The Vampire, caused a sensation, particularly in the North American press. This sculpture made later in her career is important for us to consider now because it provided an opportunity for Beveridge to write and speak about her own work. Her own words rarely emerge in the public discourse print. Her thoughts about gender and sexuality, although they may have evolved in the decades since she made The Veiled Venus, perhaps provide a framework for thinking about her early work. In the catalogue to the exhibition, Beveridge wrote of the vampiric relationship between men and women, in her words, showing that man takes all always, that, women gives, that woman gives everything. An illustration of gender politics may have been the most literal interpretation, but Beveridge was also keen to emphasize the vampirism of the economic inequality of the Gilded Age, alongside the ideas that humans were capable of intellectual, emotional, and moral vampirism too. The vampire went on to be displayed in Munich and was intended to be shown in New York on her return, but American Art News published the following denouncement and Beveridge remained in Munich. They published, we should hardly think this possible for, as no newspaper would dare under our laws publish the reproduction of the photograph, it is hardly likely that the police, not to speak of Anthony Comstock, would permit the exhibition of the sculpture. Frankly speaking, it is not an artwork, but an indecent production. Anthony Comstock was the founder of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, and he exerted a powerful and censorious influence over the public life of the city. As with the vast majority of her work, the vampire remains untraced. Beveridge showed what appears to have been a final tranche of sculpture to an art critic from the Washington Post at her Munich studio in 1916. She reflected on the opposition to the vampire in terms that could equally have applied to the veiled Venus. She wrote, I endeavored to show that sexuality is the cause of all action and of all the wonders of nature and in life. I do not mean to shock or offend by the word sexuality. 
I do not thereby mean sin or stupidity, both of which invariably bring regret. But what I do mean is the wonderful mystery, the divine unrest of nature. I should like to tear the veil of hypocrisy away and show all the marvelous miracles of life." End of quote. The majority of the rest of the works discussed in the illustrated article share a common theme, a woman subjugated and chained to a man in the yoke miserably bound work entitled marriage about to be murdered in the mystic hands and crushed by the weight of motherhood in maternity while it might be reductive to position beverage as a proto-feminist rodan i hope you have a sense of how relevant and interesting her work remains and how surprising it is that such a prolific artist recognized in her own lifetime appears to have been largely lost to art history beverage died of a stroke on the 2nd of november 1840. 1944, while living with her sister Ray in the spa town of Bad Salzbrunn in German Silesia, now part of Poland. The Beveridge sisters' activities during the two world wars are beyond the scope of this paper. Suffice to say that their politics, particularly Ray Beveridge's descent into active white supremacism and fascist beliefs, are likely to have contributed to the absence of scholarship and difficulty locating extant works. Further research may yet uncover other surviving sculptures, but as far as I know, the veil being the only work by Beveridge in a public collection, certainly in the UK. So to conclude briefly, it's surprising that the weight of publicity in North America appears not to have translated into any particular notice of the arrival of the veil Venus in Leeds in 1901. Riley Smith's anonymity as the donor was preserved and the sculpture collection received its second large contemporary bronze after Alfred Drury's Circe, seemingly with little comment. What appears to many today is a troubling subversion of an image more readily associated with concealment and modesty. The veiled Venus is not so different to Circe in the sense that in both cases, the sculptors deployed, however thinly veiled, the cover of a mythological figure to present works that could occupy the territory of the ideal just convincingly enough to assuage concerns over the rep representation of the nude female form. If we are to follow the argument that Beveridge pursued these themes disingenuously to present sculptures that would generate publicity, we have only to remember that the extent of her self-promotion was as nothing compared to her tutor. While the veil was displayed at the Grand Palais, Rodin chose the Paris Universal Exhibition of 1900 as the foil for a solo retrospective of his work displayed in a purpose-built pavilion, elevating the output of one man as equal to the status of a nation state. Neither was it unusual for a sculptor to bolster their reputation through the production of portrait busts of contemporary figures, nor to strategically use inherited privilege and family contacts to build a career in sculpture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was absolutely great um, and um, very suitable for the week of um, international Women's Day as well, um, looking at a, a, a really fascinating woman artist. Um, now, I wonder if uh, all three speakers could return and we can um, look at the many questions that have come in. I have to confess, I, I have some questions, but I think, in fact, um, we've got a lot of questions from the audience, which I feel we ought to just um, ask um, before uh, we have, you know, the luxury of, 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 of chairs questions. Um, so um, uh, there is a question for um, uh, Marion from Layla Bloom. I don't know if you've actually answered it um, already, uh, Marion. Um, Layla asked if you have, if there was more interest, uh, as far as you were concerned, in the detective work for sculpture than paintings. Um, is that possible to answer? So it's probably rather one of those open questions. <laughs> Um, I did actually answer um, direct to uh, to Leila, but I will just say um, we um, it, sculpture is a new area for me. I came to Art UK to um, look after paintings discussions, so um, I would say really it's it's been uh, hugely educational for me. Um, I try to add a really wide range of topics to Art Detective um, rather than focusing on you know either painting or sculpture. So um, we just have a good mix, really. Okay, that, that's good. Yeah. Um, 
then um, a, a couple of questions for you, Malcolm. Um, uh, one of the one, one of the um, I think again it may have been in chat. Uh, VC Price, who as City and Guilds said, just it's a comment, just saying that uh, in his training at, or her training possibly at City and Guilds, circles were always considered very and set, settings were very much part of the training. So you know what you say absolutely corresponds with what is taught today. Um, I think it may be that curators have lagged behind. Artists knew it all the time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, then there's an anonymous comment asking you what the difference is between a pedestal and a plinth. Yeah, um, here, I, I mean, for years, I've been using these terms rather promiscuously and vaguely. Um, and, um, but, but what I found very helpful was a great analysis by, by, by Nicholas Penny in, in the, the Casper volume on, um, which I'm looking at the, collecting sculpture in early modern Europe and it's a very um, overview of, of all these different terms and the development of different um, bases of various sorts and so so I followed his um, terminology or I'm going to do so now from now onwards um, so the pedestal has more of a vertical emphasis and a plinth is um, more horizontal. And then a sockle is something small that relates to something larger above. So as in the case of a, a, a bus, um, I think there's still a, a fair amount of sort of slippage, but that seems to me, those seem to be really helpful mm. um, definitions. Mm. Thank you. Um, then um, again, I think this is primarily for you, Malcolm. Kerry Thomas um, asks, um, to what extent can classicizing forms of the elevating sockle be related to contemporary neoclassical architecture uh, and its manifestations of class and power? Yes, I'm, I'm sure that's, that, that, that's so, not least because you use the sockle to, to, to or the pedestal or the plinth to put on an inscription or um, a coat of arms um, to denote status. In, in the particular case I was talking about, I think it's, um, I think if, if, if um, the bus had been done for a setting, say, of around 1760, um, the, the forms might have been more strictly neoclassical. Here, I think what Rubiliac is doing is reverting to uh, an earlier, um, less strictly neoclassical, more uh, Palladian, um, even Baroque um, language. So, I, 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 the, 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 of course, the, the forms are basically classical, but, but there's, there's a sort of richness and, and um, monumentality and almost excess um, mm -hmm. that I think is, um, the sculptor responding to this um, earlier set. And I, and I should have said that the question then goes to you, Rebecca, um, and says, does the low plinth of the, um, uh, of the Venus, you know, that, that, that's, that's a, a counterpoint to, to, to the sort of uh, messages that the sockles are, giving, are being given in the, in the Ligonier. Do, do, you, do you want to comment on the, on the low plinth that you've got for the Venus? Sure. It's um, been very frustrating not to be able to find an image so far of the veiled Venus as it was displayed in 1900 in Paris. Um, the plinth on which it has been displayed at Leeds for as, as long as I know has been fairly low and quite plain. And that has resulted in, in quite a lot of interaction uh, with the public. Um, I was um, uh, tasked with, uh, with helping to actually clean the bronze in, in 2017, just ahead of Leeds Art Gallery reopening after a period of closure. And it was fascinating to spend so much time with the objects, sort of very up close and personal. And one thing that we found was, um, and please forgive me for uh, <laughs> the directness of this um, answer, we found that the public had been uh, tremendously engaged with, with both the toes and the nipples of the sculpture. They had become sort of rubbed completely free of their 
patina to, to the raw bronze. And uh, we would often find people sitting on the sculpture and having their pictures taken. So I think that it definitely did invite interaction and participation in ways that we uh, didn't necessarily enjoy. <laughs> Actually, it, it reminds me in, in, of you know, years and years ago, there were two bronze dogs that left them green and their noses, not, not, their noses were always getting rubbed really on the staircase. So it's, yeah, people can't resist, can they? Um, okay, um, so um, Pauline Rose um, had a question, which again is really for you, uh, Rebecca, um, which is, um, she says, given that both were society figures, why do you think the press in the US was so hostile to Kuna, whereas coverage of Kathleen Scott in the UK was largely admiring? Does that tell us something about the popular press at the time in each country? It's a really interesting question. I think there are lots of different factors. The, the early press, while she was still in her teens, tended to be relatively positive, it tended to position her as, as a precocious talent and a, an unusual talent. Um, but I think somewhere between aspirations for a career on the stage, the, the, the sort of public nature of her mother and sister and the whole family having quite an unusual trajectory um, in society, having effectively fallen from grace uh, when her mother divorced her first husband and, re and remarried. They were just a problematic family uh, in some ways, very difficult to pin down. And once Kuna started to produce sculptures that were openly critical of um, the gender balance between men and women, started to express um, sexuality, eroticism, uh, they became quite difficult for the North American press to tolerate, I think, especially, uh, I mentioned Anthony Comstock in New York and that very censorious atmosphere uh, around the turn of the century. So she just wasn't making polite objects, I think is one of the answers. And as she became more engaged in her, uh, her German side and started to affiliate herself more with Europe and especially with Germany, uh, particularly during the First World War, I think quite understandably the North American press became intensely suspicious of her allegiance. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, I, I, I should have said I realised because I'm trying to keep up with all the questions coming in. The, the, the question about the legend actually was from Rebecca Senior. Um, and somebody called Laurie um, has said that pedestals and sockles are elevated, uh, protect the work. So for example, war memorials and commanders on horseback. Um, so that's another, another comment really. Um, and um, uh, Kerry Thomas has said that, um, uh, they're reminded of uh, Medardo Rosso and Rene Magritte. This is um, the um, uh, beverage, uh, you know, the, the, the style reminds reminds her of Medardo Rosso and Rene Magritte. So again, that, 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 that's simply a comment. Um, I, I, I wondered um, if, uh, well, I don't know, do any of you have questions for each other? Because obviously your papers interact very interestingly. I don't know if any of you wanted to ask or make any comments yourselves. Um, I, I had a, a, a question and comment for Rebecca. I was, I was wondering about, was there an awareness of those earlier um, figures? Perhaps you mentioned this and I was busy sort of replying to a question on the question and answer or the chat. Um, uh, screen, but um, was there is there a relationship b b between um, your um, figure and and those earlier veiled um, figures by Corradini and then more recently by 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 Monti? That's what I was thinking of with my head in the past. Mm. But a wonderful talk, by the way. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Mark. And that's a really interesting question. And it's something I, I was close to bringing up. That was running out of time, yeah, yeah, cut, yeah. cut, cut all like, sorts of things out outside of this, but, but I was very much thinking of Monty. Yeah. And it's a perfect contrast really, isn't it? The idea of a Monty upstanding marble bust that completely, um, the, the sort of detail, the fastidiousness, um, 
of the marble carving is entirely opposite to the, the horizontal bronze where the veil is being sort of actively pulled into the face. It's a, quite a distressing image from some angles. So it's that contrast between concealment, modesty, and something that some people have interpreted almost as a sadomasochistic right, yeah. gesture. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it certainly, it could be, I'd, I'd really like to explore that more, Malcolm. And uh, I'm not sure I can give you a really good answer, but I, no, no, I think no, no, something I was, must uh, be there. <laughs> that idea that came up from it. I have Absolutely. To say, the same thing occurred to me, and I, 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 I wonder, although this is far less interesting, really, if it's also um, a way of uh, expressing her virtuoso abilities. Because obviously, being a veiled figure, whether it's marble, mm. whether it's bronze, it, it's it, it's quite an interesting play and quite a difficult thing, I would imagine, for a sculptor to do. So there may have been also I'm I'm unable to do this. I'm I'm I'm, I'm clever enough to do this. I, I I don't know. Um, I tell you the other thing that struck me about Beveridge was, uh, or maybe it was just the nature of the, the photographs. It reminded me of sort of silent movies. You know, the sort of melodrama. Um, and the fact that she did want to be an actress, so there was something very theatrical and dramatic about her, her work, um, which seems to be in tune with the times in, in many ways. Um, um, well, we're, we're actually heading, well, we, we have headed towards the end of the session, so I would like to thank you all once again. Um, you, you, you've really um, made us all think much more clearly about all sorts of aspects of sculpture and very much illustrating the um, achievements of Art UK and um, especially Marion you. I, I was so interested by the discoveries that you and your team have made and uh, no doubt will continue yeah. making. So thank you again and I think we now close down and if I remember rightly we return for the next session at 11 o'clock. So people can sign on again for the second session of today. Thank you again. Very good. Bye. 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 Bye.